Sometimes it's been a while between our connections, but he is uh, just a man of God, such a gracious pastor, and uh, you are blessed to have him, and I trust that he has coming months is Pastor Appreciation, so you better let him know. <laughs> you know, I, I, heard, I heard the other day that uh, every 30 days in America, 50 pastors leave the ministry. 50 pastors are leaving the ministry every month here in America. It's not an easy job, so pray for your pastor and uphold him. And uh, I'm so thankful that uh, that I get to see you you today. I, I pass by here quite often because we have my son lives over here in Hilburn, and more importantly, my grandchildren are there. And so uh, I often come up by Ola Road to make the left-hand turn on 202 here. And of course, I've known this church through the years and uh, known uh, the building. I've been here uh, in, in, for various occasions through the years. But it's great to see you filling this house today. And uh, it is wonderful always to, to know that the church is its not the edifice, is it? It's not the building. Uh, it is the people. You are the church today. You don't go to church. You are the church. And you are declaring the glory of God in this in this place. Uh, is there a steeple on this building? I meant to look before I... There isn't. No. Um, you know, m many churches, of course, have what we call a steeple. And, and uh, it, it's interesting to me that so many Christians don't even know the reason for a steeple. Uh, one of the most obvious reasons might be simply that it's it's pointing upwards, right? And it gives us this sense that we are to look up for our redemption draweth nigh. It is this idea that we are to set our hearts on things above, not on earthly things. But an interesting thing about the steeple is that uh, sometimes I, I ask this question in the membership class, what's on top of the steeple? And the, the standard reply to that is a cross, of course. But there's something else that is often on the steeple of a church. I wonder if you know what that is. The only one I know of in Rockland County is down uh, at the Reformed Church, down near the throughway. And if you ever notice that steeple over there, it would be to your left as you're going toward the bridge. There is a rooster on the top of the steeple. And you say, what the, what's the purpose of that? You know, And many people think, well, it's just a weather vane. But it's not. It's not. The rooster, can you guess, takes us back to the story of Peter. When Peter denied Christ three times, when he denied Christ three times, the rooster crowed, right? And so... The, the rooster on top of the steeple, and of course in Europe, there were so many huge steeples. I've gone to villages in Europe where the steeple is the highest thing in the entire village or town or city. And so when you look up, you're seeing the steeple, you're seeing the top of the steeple. And the point was this, that wherever you are, in the city, out in the fields, when you look up, you'd see that steeple. And you'd see the rooster on the top of it. And in your heart, you would say, let me live my life in such a way that I would not deny Christ as Peter did on that fateful day. And I trust that that's your desire today, to be the church, you know, to live out there in the world. You know, where there's church gathered here today, but you're the church scattered through the week, right? And uh, God doesn't want you to hang out in church all week long, you know. The disciples wanted to stay up on the mountain, right? The Mount of Transfiguration. He said, no, we've we got to go back down, right? Down the mountain and into the world and be the light of the world, be the salt of the earth, be that which changes our environment. And I trust that you are sensing God's call to do that. I was looking in your bulletin at your vision statements. Uh, for a few moments before the service began. There's a lofty vision there. There's a great vision there. I hope that you'll remind yourself of the vision of your church and pray to that end that God would greatly use you to uh, influence and impact your communities and neighborhoods around here. 
But I want to take you this morning to a very familiar passage of Scripture. I trust that it is familiar to all of you. It's in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And I'm going to be call, talking about the calling of God today. The calling of God. Uh, often when we, when we speak of the call of God, we think, well, that's the pastor. He, he has experienced the call of God. I, I know that I did. I came to faith in the Lord as a, as a young man, as a child, like many of these on the front row here today. And, and I grew up in the church and I heard the word of God. But there was a day that I felt, I sensed that God had a particular call in my life, and that was to ministry. And as much as I tried to escape that through my teenage years, I had to come to grips with it and finally give in. But I want to tell you today that it's not only the pastor that has a call from God. It is each and every one of you. And we're going to look at what we might label a call narrative this morning. How many of you understand there are several of these instances in the Bible where God distinctly calls a man to his service and to his purpose and plan for his life? Well, we shouldn't just say, well, that's, that's for a select few. That's for, uh, in fact, the, the pastor shouldn't be called the minister, really, because all of us are ministers, aren't we? In fact, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, what do they do? They equip the saints for the work of ministry, right? And so you are the ones who carry out the ministry. God has a call in your life. God has a plan and a purpose for you. I want you to uh, just look at this text, and I'm going to go through it. Not, I'm not going to read the entirety of, of the passage uh, I, I trust that many of you will go home and read it once again, once you're at home. But I'm going to begin at, at verse 1 of chapter 3, and we're going to take this uh, in bits and pieces, okay? So, first of all, it says, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert. Now, let me just stop there for a moment and say that uh, Moses, his life can be easily divided up into three parts, right? First 40 years, Moses enjoyed the pleasures and the treasures of Egypt. You know the story well. He was born while the Israelites were enslaved by the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And uh, Pharaoh, of course, saw so many Israelites, they were uh, growing in number, and so he said, we've got to do something about this, lest they rise up and revolt against us. And so he began to uh, destroy the boys, the little boys, uh, among the Israelites. And he said they, they must be thrown into the river. And here, Moses' parents, being godly people, having faith in God, they, they hid him for a time, they hid him for a few months, but eventually, of course, they couldn't keep it silent, the crying of this little one, and so they threw him in the river, but in an ark. And they sought to preserve his life. And so, there in the, floating in the river, this little ark, baby crying, who hears him but the princess, right? The, the, the daughter of the Pharaoh. And she has sympathy for this little one, and she takes him, and, and she actually uh, accepts the boy's mother into the house as his nurse. And so Moses' mother is able to care for him, to raise him up, and I'm sure to have input into his life and understanding of who he really was, the God of Israel and so on. Well, he grows up, of course, having the best education possible. Uh, he, he has enjoyment of all that's going on in Egypt. I don't know, you know, once in a while, my wife and I get down to New York City, and I, 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 I'm sure that many of you enjoy going down into the city. Uh, most of us just like to go down and get out of there again. But uh, I've often thought, wouldn't it be fun to just live in New York for a long time? Maybe some of you have. I, I grew up on Staten Island, but that was the farms, you know, <laughs> in my day. But uh, I've often thought, wouldn't it be nice to be able to walk out to the door or walk down the street to the Metropolitan Museum of Art or uh, to Lincoln Center or what have you, and uh, just, just to have that at least for a time. Well, that's the kind of uh, thing that I'm sure Moses enjoyed, uh, a life that was just full of 
art and culture and, you know, even today, people travel thousands of miles to see what is just the remnant of this magnificent civilization and culture of the Egyptians. The pyramids, the Sphinx, all of that. Moses was in the middle of that for 40 years, right? And then you know the story. He killed a man. He took the life of an Egyptian because he was beating on one of his fellow Israelites. And so he had to what? Run for his life, head into the hills. And so he does. And then 40 years of his life, this is the second third, right? The second third of his life is in the desert. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but what is there to do in the desert? What kind of culture shock was it to move from, you know, the center of this great civilization out into the desert? And the scripture here says it was the far side of the desert. I mean, this was a barren wasteland. And I don't know, I think the weather's pretty much the same every day in the desert, isn't it? You know, can you imagine being a weatherman for the desert? You know, 95 and sunny, I can't do that. <laughs> it's like every day, day after day, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same old thing. How many of you ever feel that way about your life? It's the same old thing. It's a, it's a routine. You get into the grind and you feel like, you know, nothing exciting is happening anymore. Well, in the midst of the routine of life, I want to just tell you today, God can show up. Amen. God can show up. And not only does God show up, but God speaks up, right? And God calls his servant. And so let's read these next few verses. There, verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And so he thought, I'm going to go over and see this strange thing. Why this bush? doesn't burn up. Now, I would assume that bushes in the desert occasionally did burn up. They were dry. They were like kindling, you know. A spark could ignite them. But, of course, they would be consumed. They would be gone in just a moment. And so Moses saw this, maybe didn't think much of it to begin with, but then as it continued to burn, and there was something about this bush that attracted Moses, he said, let me go over and see this thing. And so, God calls to Moses. Moses. You know, God does have a deep voice, doesn't he? <laughs> you know that, kids? Moses. Moses. God speaks his name. And of course, Moses, taken back, responds, here I am. And then it says in the text in verse 5, don't come any closer. Don't come any closer. Take your sandals off, for the place where you are standing is, what? Holy ground. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't think the term holy land is really a proper term anymore for Israel. You see, because God, God makes something holy when he sets it apart for his use and for his purpose. And this ground was holy when Moses came up to the bush because there was the manifestation of God on that day. God used that land, that piece of turf, for his purpose. But today he's not into holy ground. He's not into a piece of turf anymore. Aren't you thankful that, that uh, the manifestation of God is no longer limited to Israel and to Jerusalem and to a temple over there, far across the ocean. Now, what, what does the Lord say? The Lord says, through the Apostle Paul, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives and he dwells in you. And then he says, if anybody destroys the temple of God, look out! Because God will destroy you. Wow. We ought to take a step back on that one, right? Think about, how do we... How do we speak of the church? When we're overly critical of the church, of the pastor, be careful. Because God's church, really the apostle is saying, is holy. It's sacred. It's set apart for his use. But then he says, and that's what you are. The reminder is, and it's you in the plural, not singular. 
I know, I know today our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 6. But when we're in 1 Corinthians 3, we need to understand this is you all, as the Southerners would say. <laughs> right? And, and uh, if you're speaking Spanish or some other language, it would be obvious. But in English, it's not. It's, we need to understand it's not singular, it's plural there. You. You, as, as you gather today, right? As, as the, you lift your praise to the Lord, what does God say? I inhabit the praise of my people. So God is seated here. God is here. This is a sacred place, isn't it? We need to understand the sacredness of his church. And so for Moses, it was that piece of turf. For us, it's the house of God. It's the people of God. God introduces himself to Moses, right? I am the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it says Moses hid his face because he was what? He was afraid to look at God. I want to ask you today, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Kurt David Jack Jeremiah just wrote a book on different things that we might fear in life today. And death might be one of them. Disaster is another. Depression. A lot of D's here. Debt. Disease. All right. We might fear any of those D's, but what we need to fear is the deity. What we need to fear is God himself. And when we fear God, you know what? All of the other fears disappear. Are you with me here? If we put God in his rightful place, right? If we understand the awesomeness of our God, the holiness of our God, then all of the other fears, I don't have to worry about death or disease or disaster or any of that stuff because I know who holds tomorrow. I know who holds the future. And I know he holds my hand. So God is the one who is the controller, the sustainer of the universe. God introduces himself here to Moses. And, and, you know, think about this. There had not been any direct encounter, apparently, since the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're now 400 years down the road. People have forgotten those encounters that the patriarchs had. Oh, they tried to preserve the memory. I, I don't doubt that Moses had heard of those encounters through his mother. But the Lord says in verse 7, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering, so I have come down. Do you recognize something that's repeated in those verses or those sentences? I, I, I. God says, I, I, I've heard. I've heard the cry. I've seen their misery. I am concerned about their suffering. Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. I, I, I love Isaiah chapter 40, and many of you know the last verse of that chapter. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles that run and not be weary, that walk and not faint. But just prior to that, the question is asked. The question is, is, is asked. And it's, uh, why, Jacob, do you, uh, let, me, let, me, let me look at it real quick because I, I quoted it correctly, okay? Uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you ever feel that way? Why is my way hidden? Why is why has God forgotten me? Why is He neglecting me? <laughs> but then the answer is, don't you know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, <laughs> the Creator of the ends of the earth, and He will not grow tired or weary. He gives strength to the weary. He gives strength to the weary, and they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You know the Hebrew word there literally means that they will be braided together. And I, I, when I think of that, I often think our strength is like a piece of thread, isn't it? And his strength is like a, a real strong steel chain. You braid a piece of thread with a steel chain, and guess what? 
all of a sudden the thread is as strong as the chains, right? And I think of my own weakness and my inability, but I know that when I'm braided together with him, uh, his strength is my strength, right? And, and I can do what I could never think of doing before. And so, God says in verse 8, I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land. And, and so, God is saying to Moses, I'm going to rescue them. And Moses is probably saying in his mind, well, it's about time, God. This has been going on for too long. And so I'm so glad that you finally showed up and you're going to do something about this. God says, I'm going to bring them out to a land of milk and honey, to the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Patriots, the Pirates, and the Jets. <laughs> I don't know. When you go through those names, you've got to use your imagination, right? <laughs> now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you. <laughs> and I wonder how Moses reacted to those words. Well, you don't have to really use your imagination, because we see it in the text here. God says, I'm going to do something about this. But how is he going to do something about this? He's got a man. He's got an individual that he's calling. Calling to a task. And what does the man say? Oh, you got the wrong guy. You have the wrong and, and as we read through going on into chapter 4 here, it is obvious that Moses says, I can't do this. I'm, 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 I, 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 don't, 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 don't talk so good. He was a stutterer, right? He said, I can't stand before Pharaoh. I can't speak. I can't do this. Who am I, verse 11, that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should go before this great ruler bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? I want you to understand today, that's the wrong question. The question is not, who am I? But it's, who are you? Who are you, Lord? You see, it doesn't matter who I am. Every call narrative that we find in Scripture, they're pretty much the same. God comes and speaks up behind Gideon, right? And the angel of the Lord speaks to Gideon, Oh, mighty warrior! Gideon looks over his shoulder and he says, Who's he talking to? <laughs> And Gideon can't help but respond, I am the least of, of my family. My family is the least tribe of, of, of the tribes of Israel. Who, who am I? Jeremiah, he got the call of God, right? He heard the voice of the Lord. And, and, and Jeremiah says, I'm too young to die. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just a youth. How can you use me, Lord? And it's the same over and over again. There are people who feel ill-equipped. But when God calls, He equips us. When God calls, He equips. And so we come to verse 12. And, and th this I love because Moses had asked the question, who am I? God could have said, just what I said a moment ago, that's the wrong question. It's really, who am I? But God simply says this. What does he say? I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. I want to tell you today that uh, fear not is the most frequently found exhortation in the Bible. 300 times. Either God or Christ himself says, Fear not. I guess we have a problem with fear, don't we? Right? And, and, and it hasn't changed, has it? And, and, and some say the fear of public speaking is bigger than the fear of death. <laughs> so I'm in trouble here, right? We're, we're in trouble, those of us who have to, you know, put this together every Sunday morning and stand before a crowd. We have our fears. But God says, fear not. Why? For I am with you. 
I am with you. That's all you need to know. I am with you. And so here's, and, and, and I, I put on these slides here, the principle of divine presence. The principle of divine presence. You'll also see there's the principle of divine perspective. You see, I need to know who God is. I need to see who he is. I need to, to understand his person. And God says in the text here, this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you'll worship God on this mountain. Here's what it's all about, friends. This is the reason God calls. This is the reason God saves. This is the reason God intervenes. This is the reason God speaks to us. Why? Because he's looking for a people who will worship him. And, and, and that's, it's the same today, isn't it? God says, I just, I just want people who will be set apart, who will be rescued, who will be, live, be delivered, who can simply glorify me. And so that's why we're here today. You'll worship God on this mountain. <coughs> Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to God of your fathers who sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. And of course, uh, when I grew up in church, it was always Jehovah. How many of you remember Jehovah was, was the name of God? Well, we now understand that it's not Jehovah, it's Yahweh. And that's just guessing at the pronunciation. The original Hebrew has Y-H-W-H. Didn't have any consonants in the original Hebrew. And so the, the, the people of Israel, they heard this name, but you know what? They didn't want to say the name. It was such a sacred name. I think there's a lesson in that for us. One of the commandments is, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, the Israelites, they understood that, so they said, better not even say the name. We don't want to take that name in vain, so we won't even say it. A little bit of an overreaction, right? But I think it's good for us to think about how we maybe use the name of God. How many of you, your expressions are often, oh my God. I don't think a Orthodox Jew would ever do that. We need to be careful how we use the name of God. It's a sacred name. We can and we should call upon that name. It's the name Yahweh, and of course the Jews wouldn't say Yahweh, actually they said the word Lord, which in the Hebrew is Adonai. And the name Jehovah is actually the consonants from Yahweh, and the vowels from Adonai, which were then later in place in the text underneath the word. And we get this strange mixture that ends up Yahweh, Jehovah. But all that to say, he is our Lord. And we can properly call him that. We can call him Yahweh today if we use that name properly. But here's an interesting thing. Jesus comes along. Jesus stands before those who don't know who he is, don't recognize him. And he says, before Abraham was, I was. Is that what he says? Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. We would normally say, if we existed before somebody else, before he was, I was. I was around long before he was. You know? and, um, but Jesus uses before Abraham was, I am. He uses that name that was given to Moses. There's a connection there to that name Yahweh. And then he goes on, of course, on many occasions to say, I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. Think about those claims for a moment. Could any man make any of those claims? Any, any human being who is just a human being? Absolutely not. But the one I love is this, and, and, I, and I'll just share this with you quickly. When they came to arrest Jesus, you recall, there he was in the garden with his disciples. And this troop of soldiers come, and they've got all kinds of weapons and so on. And, and, and uh, Jesus asks, who are you looking for? 
And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, we want him. What does Jesus say? Alright, it says, I am he in the English. But in the Greek it doesn't say I am he. It simply says, I am. Hey, go in me. It's the same, that the thing that's, that's translated actually from the Old Testament, I am. So Jesus says, I am. And what happens to the soldiers? <laughs> they all fall backwards, right? They are all taken back. Why? Because there is something about that name. Jesus is I that mean, I am yeah. of God. Amen? Amen? What is his name? <laughs> I am. I am who I am. It could be translated footnote tells us, here I will be who I will be. Gives us a sense of something that's coming, right? And I think that reflects Jesus around the corner. I will be who I will be. God says to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to re be remembered from generation to generation. Go in, in that name. The, the Lord is saying to Moses, go in that name. And then Moses, and I'm only going to touch on chapter 4 here. Moses says, what if they don't believe me? What if they say to the Lord, hey, hey, you're hallucinating, Moses. You've been out in the desert too long. You've got sunstroke. You know, Moses, come on. We haven't heard the voice of God for 400 years. Moses said, no, really, really, he spoke. I saw a bush burning. didn't burn up. He went on with all of this probably. So, Moses, before he goes to them, he needs assurance, doesn't he? And so I got my props with me today. And I want to conclude with this. This is the best I can do for the staff. All right? I think it's a mop handle. Today, you pretend it's a staff, okay? And maybe a little crook on the end of it. Moses is walking in the desert. Well, this helps him walk, doesn't it? Helps him climb the mountains, okay? It helps him, of course, to guide the sheep, right? There are times where he's got to, you know, hit them this way or that way to guide them through the path and where he wants to bring them. But the staff is also what?